Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm here with Colin Levy and Kim Strauss. And we're talking about the Wisconsin Supreme Court election on Tuesday. It is a habit in some states across the country to have elections for judges to the Supreme Court and other judges. And typically, these are relatively sedate affairs. Uh, People talk about their philosophy of judging. It might slip into a dispute over policy at some point, like how tough somebody is on crime. But this time, I think the fascinating thing about this is that because both parties had primaries, the candidates who were running here really were blunt, Colin, in particularly Judge Protosiewicz about where she stood. And as Kim suggested, she basically has declared that Article 10, collective bargaining law passed in 2011 by Scott Walker, was unconstitutional. She has acknowledged that she marched against it at the time. Her job as Supreme Court justice would be to, to rule on the constitutionality of the law. The Supreme Court of Wisconsin has already ruled on such a case and found it Act 10 to be constitutional. Yet asked by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel whether she would recuse herself from hearing such a case, she said, well, I'd think about it, maybe, but I'm not sure. Now, if there was ever a case where you should recuse yourself, it would be where you have prejudged the case. <laughs> And yet she is saying no because she wants to drive Democratic turnout. Oh, it's absolutely outrageous, Paula. I mean, of all the show and tell that she's done both during the primary and during this runoff election, I think that's been the most egregious to actually call something unconstitutional. Certainly, as you mentioned, she also called these electoral maps rigged. But for her not to recuse herself, I think even she knows that that's not the right answer. But if she doesn't want to tell all of those supporters that she wants to get out to vote for her, that she's not going to be there on the issues that they most want her there for. So she's definitely walking. You can't even really call it a tightrope. It's just, it's it's really an unfortunate situation. I think, honestly, it's an unfortunate situation for democracy and for the courts to see this sort of thing unspooling because we do expect, you know, a certain amount of, I don't know, just judicial temperament out of our judges. And Paul, I wanted to talk a little bit too, as we get into this, as we're getting down to crunch time in this race, about the way some of the early voting is playing out too, because I think we all know that many people think that Protosiewicz is going to have a little bit of an advantage going in here because of all of the national money that's been flowing in. I think it's hitting around $50 million now. But there are some positive signs coming out of some of the counties in Wisconsin that are interesting. You know, historically, Democrats in Wisconsin have really pushed absentee balloting, and they've been the ones that have really benefited from it. And, you know, Republicans have more traditionally turned up at the polls on election day. But in this election, you know, the Wisconsin Elections Commission publishes a daily count of the absentee ballots coming in. And there are some positive signs because these three conservative counties, Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington, are showing much higher signs of those early voting ballots coming in than they usually do. Republican can't win statewide unless he or she maximizes turnout in those three counties. They're called the wow counties around Milwaukee. The Republican candidate, Dan Kelly, is a former justice of the Supreme Court. He uh, was appointed by the former governor and was defeated in a retention election later for the court. So he is widely has been assumed, in addition to the monetary advantage uh, that you say for Protosewitz, he's been assumed to be an underdog. And also because of the abortion issue, the Wisconsin, uh, an accident of history is that the Roe v. Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court last year caused a mid 19th century statute to become the law in Wisconsin on abortion. And uh, Protosewitz has been running very, very hard on that and trying to make the election about abortion law. My own view is that the Wisconsin Wisconsin legislature run by Republicans would try to change that law. So I don't think they're going to get stuck with this mid 19th century statute. But this will be a test, I think, Kim, of abortion politics. Yeah. And it hasn't gone very good for Republicans in the 2022 midterms. We saw something a little bit equivalent to this in Michigan, where the governor, Gretchen Whitmer, there was a law that bounced back and she sort of stepped in and said, look, I'm the only thing standing between you and going back to medieval times when it comes 
comes to abortion and that and also obviously the existence of a, a sort of ballot initiative on there in the election kind of really did do some damage to Republicans who did not seem to have their ducks in a line in terms of what they were going to say on that issue. The one thing that I would point out, I think that cuts a little bit the other way, is we're also seeing in this race a uh, focus on crime, much like as in Chicago. Dan Kelly, a conservative former state Supreme Court justice who was running, has been going after Protosewitz on her record, claiming that she's very lenient in her sentencing on crime. And the reason that matters and people are watching that is because the other thing that's happening in this election tomorrow is that there are several statewide referenda that are on the ballot, and two of them actually do have to do with crime issues, including one that deals with the definition of serious harm as a criminal and also uh, some rules governing cash bail. And there's a belief that that may help to drive conservative turnout because that has been a big issue on a lot of Wisconsin voters' minds too. So it really does seem to be a toss ball. It's not clear how this is going to turn out, but both sides have their advantages and disadvantages. All right. Another thing to watch on Tuesday. Before we go, I wanted to say a word about our colleague in Russia, Evan Kershkovich, young reporter, 31 years old, but in uh, many ways an old hand at uh, covering Russia, was arrested, snatched out of a restaurant by the security services in Russia, and as far as we know, is now in detention and has been brought to court and will be charged with what we believe is a specious charge of espionage. Our lawyers have not yet been able to speak with him. The U.S. Consulate Services, as far as we know, have not been able to speak to him. And this is a most distressing situation. Of course, he has uh, the legal right to report in Russia. The foreign ministry has approved his ability to do that. And we're grateful that the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, raised uh, his detention on Sunday directly with the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov. Joe Biden was asked about it, President Biden, last week and said that Russia should let him go. Russia is, of course, claiming that somehow Evan is a spy. This is preposterous. But, Colin, we don't know what will happen to our colleague. And sometimes these people are released, but not before spending many months there in detention in very ugly places. Yeah, it's a really distressing development, Paul. And there's no question that the action comes from Russia, you know, with an intent to intimidate other press and to embarrass the U.S. to somehow move the line of scrimmage. You know, we obviously saw the detention of Brittany Griner and the fact that the U.S. negotiated a release for her. And I think they're definitely trying to sort of test the waters here and see where they can get with this. And I think it's just the state of affairs now with countries that think they can intimidate foreign press, specifically U.S. press. It's not just Russia. China has done this too. You know, you see the crackdown, uh, not just on Chinese internal media, but also on foreign media detention. I think they had 127 journalists detained in China a couple of years ago. And so I think we need to really be grateful here for the freedoms that we do have. And even when things are tough with the press here, we always have to be grateful for what sets us apart from these other countries. It's distressing, Kim, that seems to be uh, in some ways, the United States has lost the ability to deter a lot of these countries from taking American hostages. In fact, they seem to think that if they take American hostages, they'll get something for it. Brittany Griner arrested and traded for Victor Boot, an arms dealer who was serving a 25-year sentence in America. The American Paul Whelan has been in Russia imprisoned since 2018, charged with uh, espionage. It's a world that's a lot more dangerous for American journalists and others, just some regular Americans in countries where these regimes decide that they can get something for taking an American. Yeah, this is where the criticism of the Biden administration comes in. That deal between Brittany Griner and Victor Bout very much was viewed as Russia getting a far better deal, especially given that we did not demand that Paul Whelan also be released as part of that. You know, we more recently had this administration do absolutely nothing in response to Russian jets attacking our drone over in that region. So this is sending a message. And, you know, that raises like, what's the question? What are we going to be doing now? Why have we not expelled Russian diplomats? 
or Russian journalists. I mean, this brings to mind the the last time, and by the way, I think people should know this, the last time that Russia actually detained a U.S. journalist was in 1986. So all the way back in the Cold War, Nicholas Danilov, he was a reporter with the U.S. News and World Report. And fortunately, we were, as a country, able to relatively quickly negotiate his release and return for the release of somebody else. But, you know, we started expelling people, and people forget this follow-on, but within a month of this happening, we'd expelled 100 diplomats and suspected Russian spies to kind of send the message that these things just aren't going to happen without consequences. And I think the U.S. is going to have to start thinking a lot harder about what it does to send that message globally. Very good point, Kim. I should add that Colin, Kim, and I have all worked overseas as journalists. And I think from that experience, realize that these jobs that people take, particularly in countries like Russia and China, elsewhere, Iran, others, are highly high-risk jobs. And those who are willing to work there are brave individuals. So thank you, Colin. Thank you, Kim. And thank you all for listening. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.